In the book of Acts, chapter 26, most of the chapter is taken up when Paul was brought before Agrippa. And for the sake of time, we're not going to read all of these verses, but I do want to read this morning and we'll begin down in about verse number 16. Paul was relating back to King Agrippa how that the Lord had appeared to him and how that he was saved and then how that the Lord had commissioned him and sent him out to preach the gospel and to be a light to the Gentiles. And Paul is relating what the Lord told him to do after he was saved and how the Lord commissioned him to go out. We're going to pick up in verse 16, and this is what was said unto Paul, But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin, sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meek for repentance. We're going to stop there in verse number 20. And Paul, as I said, is relating how the Lord appeared to him, and he is relating the commission that the Lord had given him in his ministry. Paul mentions in verse number 18, Paul mentions five things out of verse number 18 that every man needs. And from this verse this morning, in verse 18, from this commission that the Lord had given Paul, I want to preach this morning on God's remedy for man's ruin. God's remedy for man's ruin. In verse number 18, Paul related five things that man needs in order to be saved. Five things that man needs to be delivered from the ruin of of his sin. God has a remedy. Aren't you grateful this morning that there's still a remedy for sin? Aren't you grateful this morning that God still is on the throne this morning and has as much power as he has ever had and that God can still lift a man from the ruin of his sin, change his life, and turn his life around and, and take them from the miry clay as the choir sing about this morning and set their feet upon a solid rock. Aren't you glad that, that, that we're not left without hope? What a terrible, terrible tragedy it is to hear the words, there's no remedy or there's no hope. But God has a remedy for man's ruin. First of all, let me mention the first thing, and that is Revelation. Man needs revelation. He needs to be enlightened. Paul said that he had been commissioned to open their eyes. To open their eyes. Man needs this morning revelation from God. Do you know that man will never be saved apart from revelation from God? You say, preacher, why would you make a statement like that? Well, simply because that man will never turn to God. Man will never trust the Lord until his eyes are open as to his need. Man must have a revelation from God to see the depravity of his sin and to see the depraved state that he's in before God. You can talk to a person. You can witness to them. You can tell them everything you can think of and then a lot you, you can't think of. Tell them everything you know and a lot you don't know. And you'll never convince a person that he needs Jesus until he has a divine revelation from God to reveal to him the depravity of his sin. 
Now, David said in Psalms 51, in verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Do you know this morning that the condition of our world is a result of the depraved nature of man? That man is born with a depraved nature, he needs a savior. But until that man or woman, boy or girl, has revelation as to their depraved state before God, they'll never be saved. Jesus said that he came not to call the righteous, but he came to call sinners under repentance. The scripture said, they that are whole need not a physician. Those that are sick need a physician. Do you know how many people like to go to the doctor? Not many. In fact, uh, a person who just enjoys going to the doctor and likes to go to the doctor, probably he needs a, uh, he, he really needs a doctor, but a different kind. Amen. Who enjoys going to the doctor? I don't, I don't enjoy going to the doctor, but I want to tell you something. When I, when I realize there's something wrong with me, then uh, regardless whether I like to go or not, I'll go. And until a man realizes the depraved state he's in, he'll never turn to God. He needs revelation. He needs his eyes open to see himself a sinner before God. And the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and so death by sin, and death was passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And every person in this building this morning is guilty of sin. There's not a one in this building this morning that is without sin. But the scripture said that man must have revelation from God. So he's depraved. He has to have his eyes open to the fact that he is depraved. There's something else. I think man must have his eyes open to the danger that he is in. Do you know that every day that a man lives without Jesus... He is in danger of going to hell. He is only one heartbeat away from eternity. And for a man to live in his sin and to live without the Lord Jesus simply means that, that he's just one heartbeat away from eternity. Man, until he gets the, his eyes open to the danger that he's living in every day, he'll never turn to Jesus. You'll never convince him of that. But you know what happens when a person gets saved? I've heard people, I've heard people after uh, one right after another give testimony of the fact when they got saved, they thought that was the last time they would ever have opportunity to be saved. If they had not got saved on that day or night, they'd went to hell. I remember when I got saved, well, I was so under conviction, I didn't think I'd ever live another day. I thought, sure as a world, I'd wake up in hell if I didn't get saved the night I got saved. I realized my depravity, my depravity, I realized the danger that I was in, and then I realized that Jesus was my only deliverance. Man must have his eyes open to his deliverance. Man seeks and search, turns to this and that. He tries to break his bad habits. He tries to turn over a new leaf and do better and tries everything he can. But when he gets his eyes open to who Jesus is and what Jesus can really do for him, he'll come to Jesus. Do you know man must have his eyes open? Man must have revelation from God. There's a second thing this morning that man needs. Man not only needs revelation from God, Paul said to open their eyes, but then he said to turn them from darkness to light. Now, I say this morning, secondly, that man needs something we don't hear a lot preached anymore, but man needs repentance in order to be saved. Now, I know a lot of folks preach, a lot of preachers preach that the New Testament does not teach repentance for salvation, but I beg to differ with them. I believe the scriptures in the New Testament teach there's, that, that repentance and faith are inseparable graces. Man needs to turn from his sin to Jesus in order to be saved. Man needs repentance. And Paul said that God has commissioned me to open their eyes, that's revelation, and to turn them from darkness to light, that's repentance. Man needs repentance. Jesus said, except ye repent, 
ye shall all likewise perish. You cannot separate repentance from saving faith. You, you just can't do it. Because repentance, what is repentance? Well, repentance is a godly sorrow. But wait a minute. You knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Repentance is a godly sorrow for your sin. To the point, to the point that a man turns from his sin to the Savior. Now, I want to tell you how foolish it is to preach salvation apart from repentance. To preach salvation, excluding repentance, would be like backing up to someone to receive a gift. Well, just like Paul stated here, to turn them from darkness to light. If you're in darkness, can you turn to the light without turning your back on darkness? The Bible teaches us that salvation is a free gift of God. Jesus Christ came into this world, went to the cross, paid the price for your sin and mine in order that we might be saved and in order that we might be saved and receive salvation as a free gift of God. I want to ask you something. Here's sin. And here's Jesus. Here's darkness. Here's light. And Jesus is over here. He says, I have a free gift for you. It is the gift of eternal life. It is the gift of salvation. How can you turn to Jesus to receive that gift without turning from your sin? Now, to be saved, apart from repentance, would be like you backing up to Jesus to receive a gift. If I said this morning I have a gift up here that I want to present to Brother Herman Butler, there's no strings attached to it. It is a free gift that I want to present to him. Wouldn't you think it'd be kind of strange if Brother Herman got up and walked backwards up here to me to receive that gift and then reached his hand out like this? behind him to receive that gift. Well, that's just how foolish it is for a man to get saved apart from repentance. The Bible said down in verse number 20, Paul was talking about what he preached. He said he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but he said he showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should what? They should repent. And turn to God. In other words, they should turn from their sin to God. They, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. That's what Paul preached. We're not talking about what John the Baptist preached. We're talking about what Paul preached. Paul said that they should repent and turn to God and do works meek. And that word meek means simply worthy. That they should do works meek for repentance. We're talking about the dispensation of the grace of God. You know what we've done? We've explained away salvation. And we've got a generation of professors, and many of them are not possessors. They profess to know God. Now listen, I would not want to stake my eternal destiny on a man's profession that he professes that he knows God and he never has turned from his sin. Now, you, you can classify me whatever you want to. I'm not preaching lordship salvation. I, I know the errors of some of that stuff, but I am preaching repentance. I am preaching that when a man turns to Jesus, that he turns from his sin. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot hold on to sin with one hand and turn to Jesus with the other. But when man gets under revelation from God that he's depraved in his sin, he's in danger of the judgment, eternal judgment of God, then I believe that he will see Jesus as his deliverance and he'll want to turn to, having turned from. So man needs repentance. Man needs repentance. In the third place, man needs release from the power of Satan. Look in verse 18 again. Not only do we see revelation and repentance, but he said to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan 
unto God. Aren't you glad there's still hope? There's still a remedy for man's ruin that man can still be released from the power of Satan and from sin. The Bible said in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 11, He came to His own, His own received Him not, but to as many as received Him, to them gave He what? Power. To them gave He power to become the sons of God. And many times I hear pre people say, Preacher, I'd become a Christian. And I'd, I'd turn to the Lord and become a Christian if I thought I could live it. I, I just, I'm just not sure that I could live the Christian life. And I sure don't want to be like a lot of folks I know that are hypocrites. They say they're Christian, but they live something else. And I don't want to run the risk of being another hypocrite, so I'm just not going to do anything until I'm sure that I can live it. Now, you better be careful with that. Because you'll wake up in eternity one of these days without God and without hope. Because you'll never be able to live. I can't live the Christian life. I've been a Christian for a number of years and been preaching and been in the ministry for, for over 23 years. And I can't live the Christian life. But there's one who lives on the inside of me that can. And that's Jesus. Jesus. And man can be released from the power of Satan. Satan has a hold on, on men's life and, and, and holds them within his clutches and within his bondage. But man can be set free through and in the power of God to live a life that he ordinarily could not live within himself. Man needs repentance and man needs to be released from the power of Satan. There's still hope. For the hopeless, there's still hope. I don't care how tight Satan has got a hold of your life. You can be set free this morning. That's the message that Paul said, I come to preach. I come to preach a message of revelation and repentance. But I come to preach a message that releases man from the power of Satan. There's people in this building this morning that are living testimonies. Living testimonies that the power of God can still liberate and set people free from the power of Satan. There are people in this building this morning, their life was not worth a plug nickel. From all the outward evidence, it looked as though Satan had wrecked and ruined their life and they were down the tubes, eternally lost, without any hope. But God turned them around and God set them free from the power of Satan. And I want to say to you this morning, it does not matter how tight Satan holds you within his clutches, there is still hope for you to be delivered from the power of Satan. And Paul said, man needs to be released. He said, God has commissioned me and sent me to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. God gives man hope. God gives man power and strength and sets him free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Would you like to be set free this morning? I mean, really. There might be people sitting here on the sound of my voice. Oh, you've tried to change. You've tried to turn. You've tried to be a better husband. You've tried to be a better father. You've tried to be a better neighbor. You've, you've tried to be a better employee. You've tried to change your life. You've tried to do different. You've tried to do better. But you keep on sliding right back into that same old rut. Wouldn't you love to be free this morning? There may be a lady here this morning. You've tried to be a better mother a better wife. You've tried to do different. You've tried to change. There may be boys and girls here. This, you've tried to be different. You've tried to change with everything in you. You've tried to be different. But you haven't made it. Wouldn't you like to be free this morning? Wouldn't you love to be free from the power of Satan? God can set you free this morning. Turn your life around. And make a new creature out of you. Look at something else in this verse. 
He said to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Now listen to this. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. You say, but preacher, you don't know what all I've done. You don't know what all is on my account. You don't know how terrible that I've been. Aren't you glad that Paul didn't leave it? He, I mean, this thing is a progression in verse 18. There's revelation and repentance and release from the power of Satan and forgiveness of sin. What does that mean, preacher? That means no looking back. Forgiveness of sin. That means it doesn't make any difference what's on your record. That means it doesn't make any difference what you have done in your past. When God forgives you, He wipes the slate clean. Sins are forgiven. They're forgotten. They're forever cast in the sea of God's forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. So far as He removed our iniquities from us. Now, I asked you a moment ago if you'd love to be free. Let me ask you another question. Wouldn't you love to be forgiven? I mean, to know the, the feeling of, of the cleansing blood of Jesus, to know that regardless of what you've done in your past, I don't care how rotten you've been. I don't care how bad you've been. To be able to walk through the doors of this place on the way out of here this morning and feel the cleanness and the cleansing that only the blood of Jesus can give. To send you away from here today knowing that your sins, whatever they are in the past, that God has forgiven and forgotten them. And Satan comes to you and he says, Hey, Lord, uh, Clyde Camp down there, he used to do such and so. And the Lord says, I beg your pardon? Uh, what sins are you talking about? Uh, no, I, I don't have any record of that. <laughs> I, I mean, the slate's clean. I, I don't have any record of that. But you remember when he used to do such and such, and the Lord says, no, I don't remember that. The Bible says that he remembers our sins and iniquities no more. Forgiveness offers you justification that the slate is clean. You see, God justifies a man, wipes the slate clean. You've heard me say before, that word justification means justified and never sinned. Preacher, how can that be possible? How can it be possible for me to be forgiven and God never to remember my sin anymore? I tell you how, when God looks at you and when God looks at me, He don't see me. But you know what God sees when he looks at me? He sees his son, Jesus. And just as I taught in Sunday school this morning, Jesus is sinless. And God looks at me, he sees Jesus. Forgiven. Paul said that they may receive forgiveness of sin. You can be forgiven of every sin you've ever committed. Now, man may not ever forgive you. Man may never forget I hear, pe I hear people say sometimes, well, I know I'm supposed to forgive, but I want you to know I'm never going to forget. Aren't you glad God's not that way? But the Lord says, I not only will forgive, but I'll forget your sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. Gone. You ask me why I'm happy, as the song says, then I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood of Calvary's lamb cast in the sea of God's forgetfulness never to be remembered anymore forgiveness one last thing and I'm through not only does man need remission of his sins he needs to be forgiven and we have that in the blood of the Lord Jesus and whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins but man needs a new inheritance man needs a new residence and look in verse 18 again 
He said to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Did you know this morning that man that is saved has a new residence? I mentioned last Sunday morning, I believe it was, or maybe it's last Sunday night, there's only two destinies of man, heaven or hell. And for man to come to Jesus by repentance and faith, receive the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, to be forgiven of his sins is to have a new residence. Where will your residence be for eternity? Either heaven or in hell. Every person in this building this morning under the sound of my voice is going to spend eternity in one or two places, either in heaven or in hell. Where will your eternal residence be? In heaven in the presence of Jesus. I trust that it will. I trust that it will. While every head's bowed and every eye closed and while Brother Thomas comes and gets a song ready this morning, We're going to have a word of prayer in just a moment. I wonder this morning if there might be people here in this building say, Preacher, if I were to die today, I have no hope of heaven. But I don't want to die in my sin. I'd love to be forgiven like you were talking about. I'd love to be set free. Would you please remember me in prayer? Is there a person here this morning in that condition? And I know raising your hand is not going to save you, and I'm certainly not trying to embarrass you or single you out. But I'm going to have a word of prayer in a moment, and I'd love to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you're, and you're not saved, would you please slip up a hand and just say by that lifted hand, Preacher, I'm not saved, but I do want to be remembered in prayer. I am concerned about my soul. Please rebuild it. They just slip up a hand and just take it right back down. Just say with that lifted hand, pray for me. Anywhere? Father, take the message this morning. I've preached what I believe you've impressed upon my heart to preach. And I've tried to share the truth of your word. And now, Lord, it's up to you and the Holy Spirit. You tell us in your word that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish where until you've sent it. And Lord, I pray that people will respond this morning, that people will come to Jesus and leave this place today knowing sins are forgiven and that they're saved and heaven will be their home. Blessing this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.